Hello, I am Dr. David Clark. I lecture in theology at the University of Roehampton in London. The title of my podcast is Theology and Identity. Today, our episode is entitled A Lurid Bible Story Conjuring Images of Masturbation. So let's deal with some of the obvious questions first. Question number one, did I include the word masturbation in the title of this podcast in order to attract a larger audience? The answer is yes, of course I did. Question number two, is this a misleading title? The answer is no, not at all, because in this episode, we really are going to be looking at a little-known story in the Old Testament that clearly alludes to female masturbation. Question number three, is this episode going to give you any insights on the psychological or moral dimensions of practicing masturbation today? The answer is no, that is beyond the scope of this podcast. So that's my opening statement of disclosure. I can pause for a moment if you want to log off. But for those of you who do want to keep listening, I need to give you some background information in order to place this episode in context. In season one of this podcast, I'm working my way through the Old Testament in order to better understand how the character of Yahweh develops across the text. And I want to understand how his character would have shaped the identity of the Hebrew readers. What we've seen so far is that Yahweh has made a promise to the people of Israel. As the descendants of Abraham, his vision is to bless them and make them into a great nation. Then, as the nation of Israel flourishes, the idea is that they will draw all nations of the earth to worship God. But there's a condition attached. In order to fully become the blessed and thriving nation that Yahweh needs them to be, the people of Israel must keep the covenant that he has made with them through Moses. They must choose to love God with all of their heart, all of their soul, and all of their strength, and they must carefully obey his commands. When they obey, then they will thrive, and then through them all the nations of the earth will come to relationship with Yahweh. So a lot is riding on the people of Israel. Yahweh really needs them to honor their part of the bargain so that his plan to bless all the families of the earth can be fulfilled. But what we've been seeing throughout the Old Testament story is that the people of Israel have really struggled. After coming into the land of Canaan, they got off to a terrible start during the era of the judges. God then agreed to give them a king, but their first leader, Saul, was a disaster. He was followed by David, and it was at this point in the narrative that we had a glimmer of hope. David was a genuine man of God, and Yahweh promised to give him a son who would build the temple, strengthen the kingdom, and lead the people toward covenant faithfulness. When David's son Solomon became king, everything seemed to be on track. But then everything went wrong for Solomon. As we saw in episode 8, he enslaved and oppressed the people of Israel. He was a sex addict. He worshipped idols. And he even sacrificed his own children. So after Solomon died, the kingdom split in two. Solomon's son Rehoboam ruled the kingdom of Judah. And a guy named Jeroboam became the king of the northern tribes. Now God was setting his hopes on these men. Perhaps they would learn from the mistakes of Solomon and get things back on track. But unfortunately, as we saw in episode 9, things only got worse. In the north, Jeroboam instituted a system of national idolatry that would set the northern kingdom on a path of faithlessness that would ultimately lead to their destruction. So that's where we left off at the last episode. Now, of course, you're asking yourself the question, How in the world does all this lead up to a story about masturbation? The short answer is that, in the text we'll see today, this lurid sexual act is a symbol of Israel's betrayal. Generation after generation of faithlessness have left Yahweh in a state of frustration. He's verbally lashing out at the people because he's angry and, above all, because his heart is broken. 
Yahweh is trying to make the people of Israel understand exactly how he feels. And the bottom line is that he feels like a husband whose wife has committed adultery. It was the prophet Ezekiel who shared this graphic and disturbing story. Ezekiel chapter 16 is an allegory about a man who was betrayed by his wife. It's a fictional account that is meant to parallel real-life events and circumstances. What is particularly interesting about this allegory is that in this text, it is not presented as a story being told by Ezekiel. Rather, this comes as the word of the Lord, something that Yahweh himself dictated. It's Yahweh speaking in the first person. And what we see here is that he is willing to use very graphic, disturbing, sexualized imagery in order to get his message across. So let's go to Ezekiel 16 and see how this story develops. I'm going to walk you through the major parts of the chapter, interspersed with passages directly from the text. The story begins with an abandoned baby. We know that in ancient times, before the advent of surgical abortions, unwanted babies were brought to full term, they were delivered, and then their parents would simply leave them in the fields to die. So this story begins with the account of a baby who had been abandoned by her parents. Verse 4, And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things out of compassion for you. But you were cast out in the open field, for you were abhorred on the day that you were born. This abandoned baby represents the people of Israel. And Yahweh then portrays himself as a young man who passes by and takes pity upon this helpless little baby. Verse 6, And when I passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood, I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. He takes her home and provides for her needs. He clothes her and covers her shame. Verse 7, I made you flourish like a plant of the field, and you grew and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. Then, as she grows, she becomes a beautiful young woman. He falls in love with her and takes her as his wife. Verse 8, I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. The imagery that then emerges is that of a man who rejoices in the woman that he has taken as his own. Verse 10, I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. Soon, this beautiful young woman became famous among the nations. Under the care of her loving husband, she had become the most beautiful woman in the world. Verse 14, And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you declares the Lord God. But then something started to go wrong. All of the attention and praise went to her head. She discovered that men were interested in her. Perhaps these were men who were younger and more attractive than her husband. So she starts to play around. Verse 15, But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. Your beauty became his. 
Over time, her sexual adventures became more exotic. Taking some of the beautiful clothing that her husband had given her, she built paganistic tents where she would have sex with her lovers. And then comes the most graphic and disturbing part. I'm going to read these verses as they appear in the ESV, and then we're going to do some in-depth analysis on what they say. So verse 17 of Ezekiel chapter 16 says, You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself images of men, and with them played the whore. Now, this is one translation, and it's similar to most other modern English translations. But I fear that the ESV and most other translations are missing the point. They seem to be saying that the woman made idols resembling men, and she worshipped them. But the truth is that in the original Hebrew, the language is much more graphic. The phrase reads, Vatashi leka seleme zakar, Vatizni Vam, or literally, you crafted for yourself male objects and performed sexual acts with them. Now, as I've researched this phrase in Hebrew, it has become clear to me that this phrase, Tseleme Zakar, male objects, refers to the male sex organ. Most Christian Bible translators are too afraid to illuminate the pornographic nature of this verse. But there is a translation of Ezekiel from the Jewish Publication Society, which is more bold and more accurate. The JPS reads, You took your beautiful things, made of the gold and silver that I had given you, and you made yourself phallic images and fornicated with them. This is what today we would call masturbation. So, returning to the story, let's let this sink in a bit. A man gives his wife beautiful, costly jewelry made of silver and gold, a gift to show her how much he loves her. She melts it down, crafts it into a sex toy, and uses it to masturbate. That's pretty shocking especially if you think about the fact that in Ezekiel 16, this is God himself speaking here. But the story goes on. Not only does this woman masturbate with these phallic objects that she's crafted, but she starts to worship them. Verse 18, And you took your embroidered garments to cover them, and set my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread that I gave you, I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey, you set before them for a pleasing aroma. But it's not over yet. This woman and the man who had rescued her as a baby had children of their own. In the story, the woman goes on to sacrifice these children to these many phallic idols that she had been worshiping. In verse 20, And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whorings so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? And in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare wallowing in your blood. And so from this point on, the woman totally loses her mind. She becomes a fully committed prostitute. She builds brothels across the land where she can offer her services. She sits out on the street to draw in customers. In verse 25, it says, you spread your legs to anyone passing by. And then when that wasn't enough to draw in enough customers, She started offering her services for free and even giving gifts to the men who would come into her. In verse 33, it says, But you gave your gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come to you from every side with your whorings. So you were different from other women in your whorings. No one solicited you to play the whore, and you gave payment while no payment was given to you. 
And at this point in Ezekiel 16, the text then moves away from the allegory into a declaration of God's judgment upon the people of Israel. But the good news is that the chapter does end on a happy note. After going into graphic detail on how the sin of Israel had hurt him and how he will pour out his anger, Yahweh declares that a time of renewal will come to Israel. He had made a promise to Abraham that he has to fulfill. He does not have the option of divorce. He is bound to the people of Israel. In verse 62, it says, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame when I atone for you for all that you have done, declares the Lord. So this passage gives us a lot to digest. The first question that I want to address is this. Is there any evidence that the practice of idolatry was this flagrant in ancient Israel? This passage makes the people of Israel appear really, really evil. Was it really this bad? Now, I want to remind you as my listeners that my primary focus in this podcast has been on the biblical narrative itself. I've not been trying to prove that certain events happened, nor have I been trying to disprove anything. I just want to understand the power of the story. But there are moments when the archaeological records provide us with some insight into the context from which these stories emerged. And that can be really helpful for us in understanding what was going on. So what do the archaeological records tell us about the practice of idol worship in ancient Israel? Was it this bad? Or are the biblical authors exaggerating, making a big deal about something which really wasn't a common problem? The answer might surprise you. If a person were to survey the archaeological evidence from Israel, let's say from 1000 BC to 500 BC, without any knowledge or reference to the Bible, this person would find no evidence that the people of Israel were monotheistic. That is, they would find no evidence that Israel worshipped only one God. In contrast, there is abundant evidence across the record that the people of Israel worshipped multiple gods in the form of idols. This person would find that, among other gods, the people of Israel did worship a god named Yahweh, and the main evidence for this is found in the personal names that we see on clay seals and some inscriptions, but there also are a few inscriptions that mention the name Yahweh. But as far as material evidence pointing to the worship practices of people in ancient Israel, everything seems to indicate that the vast majority practiced polytheism, worshiping the god Yahweh as they worshiped numerous other gods. The archaeologist William Deaver has written a book entitled The Lives of Ordinary People in Ancient Israel, and this gives us some fascinating insights into the record. Deaver concludes that ordinary people in ancient Israel practice folk religion. Their religious practices included rituals at public shrines where they could offer sacrifices and libations to various gods. But the real center of ritual practice in ancient Israel seemed to be the home. Indications are that the vast majority, if not all homes in Israel, had their own mini shrines, where it was probably the women who led their families in the daily rituals. Deaver points to excavations in the town of Beersheba, where in several houses they found chalices, figurines, and even Barbie-like furniture for their little gods. Just at Beersheba, they found 54 anthropomorphic and zoomorphic figurines. In addition to these were found other cultic objects like bowls and jars and offering stands. Deaver suggests that among the religious practices that went on in these homes, there were fertility rites, blessings for animals and lands, and of course prayers to the multiple gods that the Israelites worshipped. But Beersheba is just one example among many. 
In excavations from Israelite and Judean homes from the 12th to the 6th century BC, archaeologists have discovered over 3,000 figurines. And these were not just household toys. Most often, they were representations of the fertility goddesses Asherah and Astarta. He notes that the purposes of these household deities was to bring fertility and to protect women in the process of giving birth. These small figurines were about six inches tall. In the image that accompanies this podcast, I'm showing you a picture that I took at the Israel Museum showing figurines that were found in Jerusalem, Beersheba, and other parts of Judah. Many idols like these were actually found in wealthy homes within eyeshot of the temple in Jerusalem. That is to say, everybody had these. So putting this all together, Dever, who is not a Christian, concludes that the people of ancient Israel were really no different than the other nations around them. They worshipped many gods, primarily in their homes, but also at shrines, and among these many gods being worshipped was a god named Yahweh. Based on the evidence, he doesn't believe that the worship of Yahweh was ever really the accepted normative religion of the Hebrew people during this time period. What's interesting about all of this is that on the matter of worship practices in ancient Israel, Dever and the prophet Ezekiel actually seem to agree. What the material evidence tells us is that the people of ancient Israel worshipped many gods. And what Ezekiel 16 tells us is that the people of ancient Israel worshipped many gods. But what the biblical text offers is something that the archaeological evidence can never reveal. The biblical text portrays how the practice of idolatry made Yahweh feel. And the main point here is that this practice caused him deep pain. It broke his heart. To conclude, I want to briefly reflect on what Ezekiel 16 tells us about the character of Yahweh. As described in the text, who is he and what is he like? There was a Jewish scholar named Abraham Heschel who deeply understood the character of God as revealed in the Hebrew Scriptures. Heschel wrote a book so powerful that just the title itself moves me. It's called God in search of man. Think about that. God in search of man. The God revealed in the text of the Hebrew Scriptures does not give up. He does not give in. He does not lose hope. He always finds a way to fulfill the things that he has promised. Even after the people of Israel had wounded him deeply, he kept searching for them. In Ezekiel 16, this God is portrayed as a man who had been deeply wounded by the woman he loved, the woman that had once been an abandoned baby, the woman whose shame he had covered, the woman whom he had made his wife, the woman whom he had wonderfully adorned, the woman who cheated on him, the woman who took the gifts that he had given her, made them into a phallus, and used it to masturbate. The woman who became a prostitute, the woman who outdid other prostitutes by paying men to come to her. And yet, this man did not give up on her. He did not let go. In his relationship with the people of Israel, Yahweh never gave up on pursuing healing, on pursuing restoration, on pursuing reconciliation. No matter how badly they had hurt him, he could never stop loving them. And he could never content himself to live without them. You see, the religion of the Old Testament is not presented as the human pursuit of God. It's presented as God's pursuit of us. He's coming after you. He's coming after me. He is searching for us, and he won't relent in his pursuit. That is the God whom the Hebrew Scriptures present. 
And on that note, we will bring this episode to a close. Again, the title of this podcast is Theology and Identity. Thanks for listening in today. I would love to hear your comments and your feedback, and I hope that you will join me again.